and welcome everyone to the September 20th Board of Education meeting. Please rise and we will have a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag and the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We will start with the report from the superintendent, Dr. Byrne. Good evening and thank you for joining us for our second Board of Education meeting of the 2022-2023 school year. Given that our last board meeting was one week ago tonight, I don't have much to report this evening. There is no board meeting next, next week as our schools and offices are closed on Monday and Tuesday in observance of Rosh Hashanah. I wish those of you who celebrate Lashana Tova or a good year for those who don't speak Hebrew. Our elementary back to school nights went off without a hitch last week. Milton's was Wednesday night. Midland and Osborne's were both Thursday night. By all reports, parents greatly enjoyed being back in the school buildings, having a chance to meet their students' teachers face to face, catching up with friends and neighbors in person, and taking a peek into some of the newly renovated spaces in the schools. Rye Middle School's virtual back to school night is coming up this Thursday, September 22nd, beginning at 6 p.m and Rye High School is the next week on Thursday, September 29th, also at 6 p.m. Parents will receive, be receiving communications from the schools with login links for those evenings. I've just returned from the New York State Council School Superintendent's Fall Meeting, and it was a very informative experience. I had the chance to meet with State Education Department officials, state legislators, and superintendents from across the state, and I focused much of my energy on developing a greater understanding of the educational issues that are expected to go before the next session of the state legislature. And one of those is the extreme risk protection order legislation, also known as red flag. And while, while there were significant changes in the red flag laws, and we're actually working with the Westchester County DA in training our staff, um, I learned uh, yesterday that the state senate, that Shelley Mayer is proposing a school specific ERPO legislation and that would um, give a lot of authority and ability for school districts to file a red flag petition or for an emergency risk protection order in ways that we don't have the ability to right now. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes. Um, also, I, I did give um, a presentation on Monday sharing our district's approaches to communication that was very well received. At least that's what was communicated to me. So that concludes my report for this evening. Great, thank you. And I think it will be interesting to see exactly what the Shelley Mayer presentation related to red flag laws is. So we'll look forward to getting more information on that. Uh, this evening for presentation discussion, we have our Board of Education goals for the 2002-2003 school year. 22. What did I say? 2002. Oh, yes, no. 2022-2023 school year. Oh, my apologies. Okay. All right. Yes. So, here we go. Um, I think one of the first things that we want to be certain to point to in conversation is the look of these goals. The formatting of this goal uh, sheet document is very different than in previous years. It's a conversation that was had as it relates to really trying to show the intentionality and interconnectedness between and among all of our goals that as a district and as a board, uh, as schools, without one, you can't really progress along a continuum to the other. Not that these goals are in a continuation, however, they are interconnected between and among each other. Uh, let's talk about the first packet there, the <coughs> instruction and professional development goals. Uh, one question I had as I was looking at this is, and uh, Dr. Murray, this will be for you. As a district, we have shifted our language from professional development to professional learning, but the goal is still titled professional development. And so I wondered if you could, what are your, what are your thoughts about changing that to better reflect the actual language of the district? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think I'm trying to change my own language, <laughs> so it's professional learning. Um, I think it just really speaks to the fact that we're always um, kind of 
learning um, as we, you know, throughout life, and that's kind of a more accurate description. It's we're not developing, um, but we're constantly learning. Is there a reason not to do learning and development? I. I think my only thought is if we're going to be consistent, we should be consistent right. across the board. So, you know. Yeah, I would say even the state uses the language of a you know, professional, professional learning, learning. plan. Mm -hmm. And that's why. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well. if being consistent with the state, I'm fine. Okay, perfect. Good. Sometimes. All right. <laughs> uh, when we look at the first goal, we. Um, what we've done this year with this goal is really pulled the specific skills and folded them back into and brought into the attention of the tenants of the ride commitment. In years past, we had pulled those out and this year we're really highlighting and I think again with a nod to more intentionality, certainly from the work of the professional learning uh, as it relates to critical thinking, that really that is coming out of the ride commitment and really helping to redirect the community and the board and the district and its work to the ride commitment as a driving force. Thoughts about that? Oh, well, I mean, I think it just, if I, I, I would agree with you, and I think if we're, I think before we were, what we had been doing was really calling out those specific skills, mm -hmm. like critical thinking, communication, empathy, problem solving, whatever the, the many of those that there are. Um, and now that the right commitment's been so embedded in so much of what we do from a, um, curriculum standpoint, from a facility standpoint, from uh, that it's it's probably more streamlined to be able to pull that in under the auspices of the commitment itself. And then, you know, we can talk about how um, the other attributes that we are looking mm -hmm. for um, in terms of, you know, a student-centered, responsive, inclusive, adaptive learning environment. Mm -hmm. And additionally, what we, we refer to here is uh, delivering an equitable instructional program grounded in the tenants. And I think it's important um, for us to talk about really what we mean when we talk about an equitable instructional program. And really that the main focus is to meet a person's individual needs and identify what resources they need to be able to maximize to their fullest potential. I think we as a district have had um, Instances, many instances where we are already doing that. Um, I think one of those was during the height of the pandemic when we were in an unfortunate remote world and we had community members whose students were unable to access their learning because they didn't have Wi-Fi at home. And the district was able to provide students and families with hotspots so that they could in fact access their education. And we continue to do that in a way now this year and in other years where the high school is a BYOD program. And so the district offers computers to families who, for whatever their reasons are, are unable to have devices at their own home. And so it's really making sure that we are ensuring that all of our students are able to come to this district, to work in our buildings, to work in our classrooms, and to be, and maximize their, their best potential. I would agree. Okay. I, um, I, I think the, um, some, of the, some of the other you know, as you were talking about the, the access to the wi the Wi-Fi and the ooh, Chromebooks, um, the fact that we are now um, a one-to-one -one in the middle school also, I think, speaks to that. So that you know, the materials and the uh, equipment are there for every student to be able to use. Um, and then also, you know, things like you know, we've we've expanded some of our our curriculum to differentiate more for all of our learners as well, and we're continually looking at that. So math and focus comes to mind when I think about that. Um, you know, for kids to be able to have a lot more access to learning math in ways that they might be more receptive to. Um, and that just sort of raises the, the equitable level of how that happens. Mm -hmm. And also I remember when we were going through that evaluation process and, and determining what textbook series to use, one of the 
pieces of feedback we got from staff at the time was that the way the program in which it's set up, it provides really concrete examples for teachers to be able to support enrichment opportunities, review opportunities, and um, grade level appropriate opportunities to really be able to help support those learners as they're going along in the process. I, don't know. Okay. I mean, yeah. I think the other thing we talked about during the summer also was the NWA implementation, um, having the ability to have uh, assessments throughout the year and then creating that prescriptive remediation based on needs and based on you know, the results, I think is a huge sort of investment that we've made and that should hopefully impact everyone um, starting in K, right? Yeah. And starting K. today with the administration of the fall. Yes, at least at the middle school, right? Yeah, and it is, it's having that data. It's, it, it's having hard data that our teachers and our families and our students can look at to be able to really help form their educational experiences in the mm -hmm. district. Yep. Um, okay, if we look at the second goal, the evolution since then, what we've um, done in there is we've removed the social and emotional learning and made social and emotional learning its own goal. I think that's very reflective of the work of the district, uh, certainly over the last 18 months, but even an evolution prior to that in really um, talking and thinking about our students' mental, emotional, social well-being. Um, and what we've also done in that goal is we removed the language related to professional, sorry, project-based learning, and not because that is or has gone away, it is just folded now into the experience within the district for students. The third goal is really um, just more about making it an action oriented and really that language change has taken place in all of the goals throughout the document. Make them more action oriented. Should we have the goal document up on the screen? That's what this that is. is. The goal document. This is the new goal doc. You're looking at the, you're looking That's the old, That's the old That's one. That's the old, the old one. Format. Oh, but it's red line. Yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, okay, got it's it. It's been converted to the new one. <laughs> Do you want us to start again? No, 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 no. I see, okay, the, this, Flow. I'm a lawyer, I read off of red lines. That's a lot easier for me. Uh, all right, that's all right. Uh, what we've also done, thankfully, is we've been able to remove our COVID goal. So, Yay. that's a nice one. I think before moving on from the fund and support, what I really liked was elevating the phonics and phonological awareness mm -hmm. into the funding and implementation because in my first year on the board, which was last year, watching the intentionality that Dr. Byrne and his team had put in place and seeing you know, the, the funding has been there, but now we're really hitting you know, the ground where we're able to spread that training to more teachers and really cement um, and focus on that. So that I was glad to see that elevated um, you know, in this goal document. Uh, what we also did is we removed the continuation of the implementation of the Special Education Task Force language. And again, uh, not because we are no longer thinking about or caring about or supporting our special education students, in fact, quite the opposite. And I think what's nice is that many, I believe perhaps all of the recommendations from that task force document have now been incorporated and are part of our general practice of instruction and supports for our special education students. But again, that doesn't mean we stopped working hard on behalf of our special education students, parents, and population. Um, and then also, as I said, we created a fourth goal related to um, special ed or special programming for social and emotional learning and supports. Yeah. All right, move on to operations. Yes. Okay. Uh, in operations, really, what we've done is we have moved up communication to a front and center goal. Uh, that's something that we've heard from the community time and time again, that communication is um, so critical to the experience of our families and of our students, and that's something that we have heard for a long time, uh, and some of us have experienced firsthand the need in that continuing growth. And so that continues to grow, that will continue to be a focus, but also looking to expand the positive 
responses that we've gotten from the community related to Dr. Burns Friday updates is really helping to now translate and help our home to school communication really get even further and come along. Other thoughts? I was just going to say in terms of the communication, I think the implementation of the um, conferences in the middle school, I've heard a lot of positive feedback. Again, the parent to teacher communication. I think there's you know, traditionally a lot more in elementary school, and so it's nice that we're, we're focused on that in the middle school as well. And, and there are updates coming from the teams that started last year. That's a, a new mode of communication. Mm -hmm. And um, the curriculum maps that Dr. Murray talked about, um, that's not direct teacher communication, but that will be information that's available to parents. And the um, creation of syllabi at the high school that are going to be available for families as well uh, for courses. So those are all parts of it. And I did hear that Midland will now be launching a monthly newsletter similar to, so every one of the five buildings uh, now has a monthly newsletter that's going out to families, which is really exciting. That's from the principal, the, from the principal level, yep. right? Yeah. And then when we talk and look at our capital projects goal, the idea is, um, we are fortunate to have a lot of these spaces finally completed. And so it's the ability now to get our students into the spaces, to use the spaces, and then to invite the community and to see the spaces, um, not only to take in the amazing transformations that have happened, but also what will happen educationally and how that will be such a wonderful impact for our students in the community. Okay, and then moving on to the fiscal management piece. Uh, in this one, it is, again, a slight um, verb change just to go more action-oriented, and then an additional goal relating to meeting the current financial challenges. There are lots of unknowns ahead, and we need to be aware of this and prepare for what will or and or may happen in the next year ahead, and so we want to be uh, forward thinking and attentive to those issues as we go through the school year and prepare for our budget for the 2023-2024 school year. I, I did just have a potential addition to our goals. Um, you know, something we've been seeing at the board table, you know, as we saw it last year and then, at, you know, at the end of the summer into early fall are some of the accruing change orders around the capital bond, which are really driven by just building conditions, so unknown capital improvements that are material and require funding. So just that, to me, is one of the larger fiscal challenges that we can see in front of us, so wondering if we should add language, um, you know, specifically around that um, because it's going to be something we're going to have to manage through this year, more related to the capital bond and how that moves through to the next phase. I'm not sure how in the past, you know, how detailed these have gotten, but that was something that jumped out as me, to me. And so what would be uh, uh, the verbiage? Uh, so for the final bullet, so, in, you know, just adding in something like meet the fiscal challenges of the current economic environment and, you know, our existing building conditions or because uh, unfortunately that is a material number the building conditions are causing capital commitments um, by way of change orders right now so making sure we keep that at the forefront if it's possible <coughs> I'm just I'm so thinking about that and how um, Think. Yeah. Similar to how we carried a COVID separate bullet, it may want to be it may want to be its own bullet. Oh, I can try to work around language um, for that. Yeah, I'm wondering if that might not be the better way to go because I feel like um, there are pieces of the economic conditions that are playing into what's happening at, in, at the capital project level. I mean, there's, it's all, sort of all-encompassing. Um, I think it's really just in this last few um, uh, months that we're seeing that something that specifically talks to, uh, you know, change orders related to work that was being done and then 
deterioration behind that work. So that's where that specific well, I think piece sounds like it's point, coming in. You can certainly call out something related to facilities under fiscal management as its own point, and maybe then there's a bullet under that that speaks to currently in with the capital projects and the impact that the economy and change orders has had on that and the progress that we're making or something yeah. to that effect. Yeah. I, I can try to put something together. I think that'd be helpful. We, we could I, yeah. work on it and get it back to the board and, and bring this back at the next meeting as uh, an agenda item. Okay. Yeah, I so. think putting some thought into that would be really helpful. Yes. And I think understanding and pulling it out as its own separate, instead of trying to layer it within the current economic conditions, I think is, is helpful. Okay. Are there any other thoughts, comments, questions from the board? No? Okay. And so this would be, you'd need to make a motion to remove this item from the consent agenda so we don't approve before it. Before that Correct. consent agenda gets approved so that we can put it on for the next one. Yes, I'm actually looking. Oh, it might not have been I actually, on the consent I'm not, agenda. I don't even, I think when you and I spoke, I was thinking that, the, that it was, it does not appear to have been listed in the consent agenda items. Okay. So we'll just have so to. So we're okay. Yeah. We'll just post it for consent agenda for next week yeah. and we can pull it and have a just tidy conversation about it yeah. at our next meeting. And then so it would just be that addition and then the changing the professional from professional learning. development to professional learning. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Okay. Everybody in agreement? Great. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So we will now move on to our next section of the agenda, which is time for the public to be heard. We welcome and encourage our community members to address the board at this time. Please come to the podium, state your name, address, and if you are representing an organization. To ensure everyone has the opportunity to speak, please limit your remarks to three minutes. I'm gonna ask our district clerk to set a timer. So if you hear the timer, please wrap it up. The board is here to listen. The public comment period is not designed to be a discussion. So please understand that we may not respond to your comments publicly or questions at this time. We take your comments seriously and may need more time to process and research an issue. We will ensure questions will be addressed by the appropriate staff member or possibly answered at a future board meeting. We will not entertain comments regarding individual students or district personnel as these are protected under state and federal privacy laws. Please know we take personnel concerns very seriously. On these manner, matters, we would ask you to follow the appropriate administrative channels. As a reminder, the community may submit written comments at any time to the board by sending those to rcsdboard at riseschools.org. Mr. Storrs. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the board for giving me this moment to speak. My name is Eric Storrs. My son, Liam, who was in eighth grade, was cut from modified football yesterday, along with six other eighth graders. They were cut because there were not enough helmets to go around. The boys are crushed, my son's crushed, um, and to say the least, it, um, I'm available to work with the school board and the athletic director to come up with a solution to fix this problem, which I think is highly fixable. I played football at BC and in the NFL for the Jacksonville Jaguars, and I have experience with football. And it is 100% necessary for the boys to practice with equipment and take that away, to take that away from the eighth graders because Rye doesn't have enough helmets is unfair and it feel, it's just unacceptable. The boys need to learn how to hit, tackle, shed a block, etc. And that can't be done without multiple practices with equipment on. For the boys that were cut, they offered seven on seven flag football, which isn't the same thing, and it's not going to help them out going forward. Football, unlike other sports, has a very condensed season during which, uh, during which time to practice, and it's really September, October, and some of November. That's it. You can't really play it 
effectively with equipment or in a team and coaches any other time of the year. For these eighth graders, two years ago the season was canceled due to COVID. Last year they didn't have enough equipment for the 7-8 modified, so the eighth graders got it. And the seventh graders didn't get it until I think a week before, uh, a week or two before the end of the season. Uh, and then this year they uh, cut kids and combined the seventh and eighth grade. So it's not consistent. Um, I've come to find out that they don't cut kids in high school and therefore 100% of the kids who try out make the team. Um, I, I spoke with the AD, she said that they had about 170 helmets and 130 of those helmets were used for the high school. So the JV must be like 70 players, which is, it's, it's massive. And what that does is it takes away the helmets for the modified and the younger kids. Uh, we need to apply some standards and, and keep it consistent. You know, it stunk last year when our kids couldn't play because the eighth graders got the equipment. Um, eighth graders, similar to years past, should have seniority over the helmets um, to get it. Uh, I, I would say, uh, you know, this is how it was done last year. But bottom line, eighth grade class shouldn't be penalized because of an increase in high school level interest. If 40 more freshmen decided to uh, sign up to play football, there'd be nothing for the seventh and eighth graders. That's the thought and the philosophy. There's something wrong. Um, so where are we now? Um, I, you know, look, the past is the past. We have to act very quickly for our kids to play this year. My question to the board is how, how can we make this happen? How can we effectively make this happen in a short period of time? Because there's not many weeks left and they really need to play. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Jeff Hess. Um, I live at 7 Franklin Avenue in Rye. I'm not part of any organization. Um, I just want to reiterate my support for Mr. Storr's comments. Um, it's been uh, two years without these children having the proper training and the proper uh, equipment. And I want to point out one quick thing, and it's pose it a question to the district, if we could, and the board to either answer tonight or get back to me. There was an email that went out explaining that due to unprecedented interest in the football program at the high school, they weren't going to be able to accommodate all the middle school children. As Mr. Soar rightly, Storrs rightly stated, it was absolutely not unprecedented. This happened last year at the middle school level. I wasn't, I would, my question to the board and to the district is, why wasn't that addressed last year in terms of contingency plans, resourcing, coming to the community and trusting us that we could all work together, that if this were to happen again, that we could all solve the issue. So it wasn't unprecedented. A year ago today, or a year ago this month, we were all dealing with a very similar issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Ryan Prada, 11 LaSalle Avenue. I just want to add to what these two gentlemen have said. Uh, football is very important in this community. I was a football player. My father played for Rye High School. My son wants to play for Rye High School. And uh, over the last two years, What's going to happen to these eighth graders that aren't allowed to play? It's going to put them at a major disservice in uh, ninth grade. And I just don't want to see that happen. And there's a lot of answers out there. Um, the lack of communication I'm worried about, um, Mr. Hess said, notifying us September 11th for a September 12th start date. Um, it almost feels like we're getting, you know, the runaround. And, uh, I know we can work this out. Um, myself, I'm willing to help. Everybody here is willing to help. So uh, I hope we can do something. Thank you for time. Thank you. My name is Alyssa Osier. I live at 63 Franklin Avenue. 
Um, I just want to go over uh, the series of events that occurred over the last few days. Seven eighth graders were cut from the team that historically has no cuts. Who did you cut? Um, you cut the kids looking for an outlet, a community, friends, kids that were hopefully going to be a part of something that keeps them healthy, active, and engaged. You're cutting the kids who've already been cut and have already had a harder time with self-confidence and finding their place, and you basically just shut the door on them completely. Um, it would have been one thing if we were notified in the summer when um, the high school attendance became obvious. Um, we could have anticipated this outcome and made alternative plans. So now, instead of going to football every day after school like they intended, they are going home, and they're going home alone because all of their friends are at football, and they don't have alternative options now. So, um, what's the recipe for a kid who's alone and doesn't feel good about himself? Um, I felt that this was cavalier to do the day before. Um, many kids I know worked hard and prepared and worked up the courage to go to these tryouts, um, and they were only told that they don't belong. So, once again, a blow. Um, if this school prides itself on mental health and wellness, of students, I don't know how you can deliver quite a blow like that um, to what might be already some compromised children. Uh, I'm all for setbacks and failures. I'm a strong believer that adversity builds strength and character, but let, remind you, let me remind you that many of these kids are already facing many of those. Um, they don't have three or four other teams that they play for like many of the students that are on the team now. Um, so the last thing I'd like to say is that if you're going to prioritize high school over middle school, then you should also prioritize eighth grade over seventh grade. Um, keep that consistent. And you know, this is not just about playing time. This is about riding the bus. It's about being on a team, sideline cheering. It's about game day, wearing your game day attire. It's about a, the whole experience of belonging to something. How you doing? Uh, Jason Osier, 63 Franklin, no affiliations. Um, my wife obviously addressed some of the mental health issues. You know, I think like many kids, uh, a lot of the kids struggled uh, during COVID. I think everyone in this room did an incredible job dealing with that adversity. Uh, but there were a lot of kids that got used to being home um, and, and missing some of those social outlets. My son uh, was torn about trying out for football. Really wanted to be with his friends. He plays flag football, but he's a little skinny and a little slow. <coughs> Sorry. Anyway, I encouraged him to try out knowing there was no cuts. For three weeks, he worked out multiple times a day. On Sunday of last week, I was coaching football. I coached seven teams last winter. I coached six teams in the spring. I volunteer all my time for these kids. I called my son, asked him what he was doing. He said he was going to his friend's house to watch football. I said, did you just wake up? He said, no, Dad. I rode my bike to the YMCA by myself. I snuck in. I told him I was 14, and I lifted weights by myself because he was nervous about trying out. An hour later, we get the email saying that they're going to have cuts. I immediately to contact the uh, athletic director offering my help. Uh, the athletic director was, um, I think, you know, did her job to try and to find a solution. But I, my view on this situation is that I think we have a solvable problem here. You know, this is like a retail inventory problem. So there's no, there's a lack of inventory, but there's inventory in places. It's just spread out over the place, right? So just like Home Depot doesn't know where something is, there's, there's five helmets here, there's 20 helmets here. By Thursday, I got to go to, to try and help. Uh, in 12 hours, I found over 40 helmets. I also identified that there was um, a group of boys that tried out, many of whom made the team, that already have full equipment because they play on another football team in the town league. <clears throat> so my view here is that I think this is a very solvable problem. Uh, my son's not gonna be an NFL football player. My son might not make the JV team. He just wants to play with his friends, and he wants to give it a shot. Um, 
the store's kid might be an NFL player, but <laughs> not mine. <laughs> so I would just ask that um, this, this isn't a football thing for me. This is a community thing. I moved to this town partly because I was so impressed by the community involvement in the football, in football games. Uh, my son has gone to those games the whole time. He just wants a shot. He doesn't care if he's the last guy on the bench. But, you know, today we called him and said, what did you do after school? He said, I, I went to Valtori Pizza with his four friends who got cut from the football team. So, thank you. Seeing no one else coming forward. Again, we thank you for your comments. Um, we will proceed. Uh, moving on to the consent agenda. Can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Uh, Chris Repetto, seconded by Vivek Kamath. Uh, we will take our consent agenda section by section as we do and hold for any comments. Consent agenda general. Uh, Would you like me to, to talk about the policies now or certainly. see if anybody has, does anybody have any questions about the policies that are on here? I can describe them now or after? Questions? I can't remember if we did, usually did it during, do we usually do it now? Uh, you can do it now. Okay. I'll do it now. Okay. Um, so just to just highlight, so as we're getting ready to vote on these, um, we are, have three policies in here that we are planning to repeal. Um, as you know, we've talked a lot about going through all of our policies and trying to clean up what we don't need um, uh, for various reasons. All three of these policies that are listed here um, are, are being repealed. They were reviewed at our last meeting. The first is 1050 annual election and budget vote. Um, this is a policy that outlines the, um, basically the process of the budget vote and election. Um, and it is essentially covered under election law. So we are sort of repeating what is already being followed um, that's dictated by the Board of Elections. So it's, it's really not a necessary policy for us to have. So we're recommending that we um, repeal that. The second is policy 4112.1, background checks for new hires. Um, this again is, um, in this policy, it refers directly um, and singularly to checking um, the New York State Child Abuse Registry um, whenever you're hiring a, a new hire. Um, and this process has been, um, already integrated into the fingerprinting process that occurs whenever we have a new hire. So that registry is automatically checked as part of the um, certification and fingerprinting that is done for any new hire. So it is, we're recommending that we repeal it because it is already being done by law. And then the third is 8123.1, uh, which I think is our last policy of the 1990s, All which right. is 1993. Yes, it is. Um, and this policy is very short um, policy um, that uh, talks about um, you know following uh, procedures around communicable diseases. Um, and essentially, this process is already um, defined by the New York State Department of Health, um, which we are um, and they are continually updating anything that has to be done uh, related to communicable diseases. And so, therefore. Um, we are following all of the guidelines and, and um, uh, requirements that are set forth by them. And so we don't feel it's necessary to have this written as a separate policy since it's already dictated by, um, by legal requirements. So those are the three policies that we are recommending to repeal. Okay, great. Thank you. Anyone have questions about those now that you've been re-familiarized yes. with them? No? Okay. Uh, only one, uh, I was hoping, Dr. Murray, perhaps you could just shed a little light for us on the Teachers College Reading and Writing. 
Sure. So on the uh, part of the consent agenda is the contract with Teachers College Reading and Writing Project, um, which is the um, institution we use to provide professional learning uh, for our uh, literacy program. Um, it's one piece of our literacy program, and the what it's going to be focusing on this year, particularly for our K to two students, um, is around their new units of study, uh, which are being released, which focus uh, a lot very heavily on phonics and phonological awareness. Uh, so we're looking forward to to those, um, the in-house professional development we receive and the, and the workshops and conferences that we'll be attending. Um, in addition to that, um, we also receive uh, professional learning services around our explicit phonics program. Um, and then the, the third piece to our literacy program has to do with our work with Haskins Lab. Um, and as I explained uh, in the last meeting, and uh, we're going to be receiving professional learning on the science of reading for all K-2 teachers. Great. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Uh, consent agenda fiscal construction, we have none. <laughs> Isn't that a nice change? Con we, have, we have plenty of construction. <laughs> but nothing on the consent agenda, so that's a nice change. Consent agenda fiscal. Consent agenda professional appointments. Consent agenda classified appointments. And consent agenda special education. Okay, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda? That is seven to nothing. Okay. Uh, because this is just one week since we've had our previous board meeting, I only have one thing that I thought was um, worthy of us highlighting, uh, and that is the acceptance, or the formation, I guess I should say, of the Westchester Girls Ice Hockey Team. It's pretty cool when you look at the list. There are lots of school districts that are participating, and I think it's uh, an exciting endeavor to see where the girls' ice hockey team can go. So congratulations, girls. All right, uh, we have nothing for pre presentation discussion number two. Any communications to and from the board? Okay. Our next board meeting will not be for three weeks, but in that time we actually won't have that many days of school, so it won't feel as long as it actually is, <laughs> it goes with all the holidays. <laughs> but we will be talking about our book talk, which is Think Again by Adam Grant, so make sure you guys are ready. And we will have a discussion about our external audit. All right, uh, in addition, at that board meeting, we will be meeting at 6.30 at Osborne School for our tour, and then we will be commencing here at 7.30 for our public session. So, we thank you all. Any last comments? Yes, Tom? Uh, yeah, Mr. I just, um, going back to one of the things we were discussing in executive session, which I know we were, we were a little crunched on time there. I've got one follow-up. I don't, I don't know if I'm, can I request us go back in executive? I don't know what the orders of that is, but could we Certainly. just make a quick post? Certainly. Make a motion to. Yep. Make I make a motion. a motion to go back in executive session. Okay, is there a second to that? Chris Rapetto, uh, all those in favor of going back to exec session, that's seven nothing. In exec session, we will be closing out for the evening. We will not be coming back out to the public. So thank you for your attendance and participation this evening. We will see you on October 11th. <laughs>